There's a young man. We call him the rich young ruler. Came to Jesus and wanted to know what he must do to inherit eternal life. And Jesus said, well, you have the commandments. You have the law. Don't steal. Don't kill. Bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And he ran through all this list. The young man said, well, all these things I kept from my youth up. Well, what, what, what am I lacking? And Jesus says, go your way and sell your goods and give it to the poor. The text said that he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. And you think of that, and you think about a man having, if you will, so much, so much that he doesn't want to give away. So much that he's in love with it, that, that what he has, he's in love with and probably wants more, the text doesn't say, but he's in love with what he has enough to say, I'm good. I'm good. It's interesting that it really, if you will, was pushing him to want to go to heaven. And not only want to go to heaven, but to ask the master, what do I need to do and what am I lacking? But when he got down to it, that commitment that he needed, that mercy that he needed to show, he was unwilling to show. Tonight, our series of lessons continues. As we've been looking at the par oh, excuse me, parables, <laughs> Bible school, we've been looking at the Beatitudes and some of them out. And we looked first at poor in spirit, and we said that you must be humble. And then we talked about blessed are those that mourn, and that means that we need to be contrite. And blessed are the meek. The meek are who? Well, the meek are, are those that are submissive. And then we talked about blessed are those that hunger and thirst for righteousness, the desire to do what's right and need to be studious. And now we get to tonight, blessed are the merciful. When we stop and think about this, I, I want you to, to put something within context. And I really hasn't, haven't done this and done this well uh, through this series yet. And so let me kind of go over that for just a second. If you think about the Sermon on the Mount and you think about all that Jesus says and all that Jesus teaches, and in many ways what Jesus is teaching is this is how you live your life as a Christian. This is how you do You let your light shine. You follow the things that, with regards to the law. You, you, you pray, Matthew chapter 6, biggest portion of Matthew chapter 6. Don't worry about the world and the things of the world because the Lord's in charge. He's going to take care of that. And you get into the seventh chapter once again. It, he hits the, the subject of judging, but then he also hits the subject of prayer again. And, and he talks about being a wise man, sort of the illustration at the end to make the point. The Beatitudes have their place in this sermon in that they set up the idea of happiness. And we've talked about blessed being happy, a state or quality of mind, but being that which we do in order to have that happiness. And if you think about this list, how it breaks down, you have the poor in spirit. First thing you got to do in order to come to the Lord is be humble enough to know where you fit in, to, to be contrite, to say, oh, I've messed up. I'm sorry to be submissive, to say, Lord, it's not me. It's you. What would you have me to do? And to seek for what is right. But then you get to the merciful and you have to ask the question, what is merciful? You see, that's where we've been kind of going as we've been thinking about all this. If the happy person is merciful and if the, the rich young ruler evidently wasn't merciful, really, what is mercy? What, see, when we think of mercy, we really think of, of something different than really the word itself really means. The word itself, the word mercy, means undeserved compassion. When we think of mercy, we often think of forgiveness, and that's part of it. We'll see in just a second. But the basic definition of the word, and it breaks down from that. We're going to show here in just a second. But the basic definition of mercy is undeserved compassion. Whether it be the mercy that God shows to us or the mercy that we show to others, it is undeserved compassion. Well, help me a little bit with that. 
or it's emotional sympathy and pity. We talk about having mercy upon people. And we see them and we see them in their dire straits. And we have feelings of compassion and we want to do something for them. Don't you just hate those dog commercials? And don't you hate the third world commercials that talk about the hungry and those that are needing? You hate those. Or I do. I, I don't like those commercials. A lot of times if I've got the remote quick, I turn them because they just prick my heart. Well, that's in some ways, that's mercy. Feeling, emotional sympathy and pity. It's response to others' needs. It's the, the, the idea, the effort of, of alleviating, removing somebody's suffering. The story of the Good Samaritan comes to mind. The story of the Good Samaritan, as we know it, the man that falls among thieves, the priest and the Levite that walk by on the other side. You know, they're, they're too busy or too concerned about what might happen or what could happen to them or, or how that they might, if you will, they, they might be disqualified from service with regards to, to the priest. And so they don't want to get involved. But as the text says in Luke, it says, as per chance, or the word just simply means as good fortune would have it, a Samaritan walks by. Now, we know the story, and we know, we know I'm not getting too deep into it because we know the basic gist of the story. And we know that the, the Pharisees, or excuse me, the, that the Samaritans and the, the Jews didn't, didn't get along. There's a history there, if you will. It was a, a nationalistic thing. So, but the Good Samaritan stops. He helps the man. He binds up his wounds. He pours oil uh, upon the, the wounds as we would liken it into giving him medical treatment. He carries him to an inn. He stays with him for the night. He takes care of him for the night. He leaves. He goes. And when he, leave, when he leaves, though, he goes and he tells the owner, he says, here's, here's wages. He says, when I come back through, if you need more, I'll give you more. But this should take care of him. And he goes away. He has shown mercy, undeserved compassion towards this man. And so when we say blessed are the merciful, it's those that are willing to, to do something willing to alleviate the pain, the suffering, the heartache, the hurt of others. It is an extension of forgiveness, being willing to forgive. The Lord reminds us of a story in Acts, the seventh chapter. There were those that stoned Stephen. There were those that Stone Stephen, Paul being one of them, being Saul at the time, holding the coats of those that were willing and wanting to, to throw rocks at Stephen. And all Stephen had done was preach the gospel. And as he's being stoned, Stephen shows mercy, undeserved compassion towards these people. Because as he prays to God in Acts 7 and verse 60, he says, Father, forgive them. That's mercy. These people didn't deserve it. They, they were there stoning him. They were there killing him. They were there taking his life. They were not just trying to run him out of town, and they weren't just throwing at him from the standpoint of throwing at his feet, hoping that it would scare him off. They were trying to kill him. Yet he asked God to forgive them. It would be the same thing that Paul talked about in 1 Timothy chapter 4. There towards the end, end of the chapter, in First Timothy chapter 4, Paul makes the statement in verse 16, he says, notwithstanding, he says, no man stood with me, but notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me. There were those that didn't have any compassion towards Paul. But Paul had great compassion towards these individuals, and there was an extension then of the forgiveness that he was willing to offer these individuals. Well, that's mercy. Mercy, then, can also be said to be the care for others' needs, to care for others' hurts. You remember in Luke chapter 17, do you remember the ten lepers? 
You know, remember the story where Jesus healed 10 lepers and one came back and Jesus asked, where are the nine? That story. Do you remember what they begged for as Jesus passed by? Lord, have mercy on us. Mercy. What did they need? They need undeserved compassion. They hadn't done anything to the Lord. They hadn't done anything for the Lord. Now, they hadn't done anything, at least as the story tells us, they hadn't done anything to detract from the Lord, but at the same time, too, they hadn't done anything to add to the Lord. And so it was just undeserved. They hadn't merited it. They hadn't deserved it. But Jesus had compassion on them. That's mercy. Care for the needs of others. It would be like us caring for the needs of the sick, us caring for the needs of, of individuals that are, say, shuddy, and us caring for the needs of, of someone that is of age and, and can't care for themselves. It's the idea of showing mercy towards these individuals, not that they've done something for us, to us, but it is because they have a need. And so that's mercy. Mercy, then, is acceptance. It's acceptance of people. You know, Paul made the statement in the book of Romans, Romans chapter 15 and verse 7. There, there's some discussion there in the church about some things that are going on. And Paul said to receive those brethren as you've received me. To receive the idea of bringing into fellowship. These were folks that didn't see eye to eye on certain things. And yet Paul says bring them in and have mercy on them. Undeserved compassion. They didn't deserve it, didn't didn't warrant it from the standpoint of doing anything. But there was an acceptance that's needed. Now, extend that a little bit further. Extend that to the idea of individuals that you know of that, let's say, have a lifestyle that's different from ours. They live a life that that is not uh, doned in the Bible. Matter of fact, it's condemned. What do you do with folks like that? What do you say to folks like that? How do you treat those folks? Well, I believe God loves the sinner, but he doesn't love the sin. God loves the sinner, but he doesn't love the sin. And so when God loves the sinner, but doesn't love the sin, what's he willing to do? He's willing to take them in. He's not willing to say they're all right, but he's willing to love them. That's the idea. That's the mercy of God. And remember, God is rich in his mercy. Ephesians chapter 2, Paul reminds us, beginning in verse 4. And if God is rich in his mercy, I need to be rich in my mercy towards others. I may not agree with them. I may not see eye to eye. I may, well, I will. When what they're doing violates the will of God, I will share what I believe the word of God says with them to show them and give them proof to show them where God wants them to straighten out their life. But mercy says, I still am willing to love them. That's mercy. And so then mercy goes to the point, finally, of the forgiveness of God. God has mercy upon us. Do you remember, and and I'll not get too deep into it because it's next Sunday morning's Bible class, but the story of the publican and the Pharisee. And you remember that the the publican, the, the, the most, if you will, the tax collector, the most unlikely of the two is sitting there or standing there rather smoking himself on the breast. And remember what he says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. God, please forgive me. Give me your undeserved compassion. And the reality of it is, is we all are begging for, needing, desiring, wanting mercy. You say, wait a minute, I want the grace of God. I want both. (laughs) I want grace and mercy because I need both. I need the unmerited favor of God, but I also need the undeserved compassion of God. I need him to look favorably upon me even when I don't always do what I'm supposed to do. And so when Jesus says, blessed are the merciful, what's he saying? He's saying that anybody and everybody that will show undeserved compassion towards another individual, towards another situation, towards uh, towards God and God towards us, really, that that's mercy. But we are then to be people 
that are being are willing to show and willing to have that mercy towards others. Well, preacher, give me some examples, okay? How about Joseph and his brothers in Genesis the forty fifth chapter? Remember the story of Joseph as how his brothers had sold him into slavery. Really, they had they had sold him into to slavery or what they believed to be slavery. And of course, through events found in the book of Genesis, we find out that he's able to interpret dreams and he's able to rise into power so that he's over, if you will, the collection of the good of the land, the harvest for seven years because seven years of famine are going to come. He had told that. And so he had been given the, the if you will, the logistical charge of making sure that they had enough. And so they did in the second year of the famine. Guess who comes? His brothers. They didn't know and recognize him. Years had passed since they had seen him. They didn't expect to see him. You know, there are several things at play there. Have you ever seen folks out of context? If you've ever seen folks out of context, what's one of the things you don't recognize is them, right? I was at Pomona. I wasn't there. Hadn't been there, I don't know, two or three months. And I was walking through Walmart one afternoon trying to get some stuff. And a guy that spoke to me said, hi, how are you? And I said, hi, how are you? Doing fine. Thank you. And I walked down, and in a minute, I noticed that individual had circled back around, and he got in my face again, so to speak. Walked past me and said, hey, how you doing? I said, I'm fine. How are you? Fine. I thought, oh, I'm dealing with an Alzheimer's patient. <laughs> so in a few minutes, he circles back around. Guess what? He's right there again. You don't know who I am. I said, I ain't got a clue. He's one of the members, <laughs> but he had a hat on, he had shorts on, he had on an old T-shirt. No, I had no clue who he was. <laughs> and so there's a lot of things with regards to Joseph that, that that they didn't recognize. Joseph, making the long story short, saves his brothers, his family, his father. Now you say, well, that's the providence of God at work. Amen. Amen. But that's the mercy, because you see, his brothers hadn't treated him well. They didn't like him. They were jealous of it. Well, why was why was he that why were they, excuse me, let me get the proper English. Why were they jealous of him? Well, you know, dad liked him more than they liked the rest. Parents don't show favoritism towards your kids. Don't do it. But nevertheless, or towards your grandkids. I will say that I do often tell my daughter in law, you are my favorite daughter in law. And she's got a good comeback for it, but uh, she's my only daughter-in-law, and will only will always only be my only daughter-in-law. And so, so, but uh, she, we don't show favoritism, but yet, nevertheless, Joseph was hated by his brothers. Joseph had been separated from his family all these years because of his brother. Joseph could have sat in anger when his brothers came, but Joseph had mercy undeserved compassion towards his brothers that hadn't treated him the way they should have treated him. Now you think about Joseph, and you also think he received mercy, didn't he? Remember when when he was, was shown favoritism towards the prison keeper in the 39th chapter of the book of Genesis, how that he was put in charge of everyone. He was able... To, to, if you will, take authority. Now, he didn't deserve that, that mercy. He didn't deserve that compassion. But he was given that role. He was given that position. And in giving that role or giving that position, you see mercy exemplified. It was not just a, a forgiveness of, of the wrongdoings, if you will. But it was mercy extended to him that says, here, we want you to have this position. And so Joseph is a great example of mercy. David is also a great example of mercy. David was mistreated by Saul. Now, if you go back, and maybe it's been a while since you've read that beautiful story. But if you go back and read the story, you know that David goes to see his brothers. They are fighting if you will, they are fighting. There is a giant there by, by the name of Goliath who comes out on a daily basis and talks about the Israelites. And, and everybody's scared 
because by all accounts, this giant is about nine and a half feet tall. And they're just average run of the mill. You know, well, we don't want to go out there. I mean, he's a big dog with big talk. And we don't want we don't want to mess with him. We're afraid to mess with him. And David goes basically to to bring some victuals or some food, if you will, to his brothers, sent by his father, but to carry food to his brothers. And when he gets there, here comes out here comes the daily barrage from Ogoliath out there, and David says, Who's that? And they said, well, that's Goliath. Well, what does he want? Well, he's going to talk a little while for us. Well, they says, why don't we do something about him? And they said, well, um, look at him. Okay. David said, I'll take him. Well, they try to put the armor on him, and he goes out. And let's make a long story short. He goes out and he kills giant Goliath. He comes back. And the women are singing an antiphonal song. An antiphonal song is just a song that starts out sort of with a bass foundation and it builds bigger. Saul has slain his thousands. Here's how it works. Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. See that group? Now, not always does, does that mean literally. It's just to show a bigger, if you will, bigger style. Well, this seems to have, if you read 1 Samuel, this seems to have ticked Saul off. Saul didn't like that. And Saul and his men took after David and his men. They, yes, David had men with him, a couple of hundred at least, one count and maybe more at others. But David had his men with him. And David was basically fleeing, not because he had done something, but because Saul was after him to kill him. And there came, came a time, the cave at En Gedi, found in the book of 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel, uh, let me get this right, 1, 1 Samuel 24. And in 1 Samuel 24, in the cave at En Gedi, David is there. Saul comes in basically to relieve himself. And through events, David is told by some of his men, kill him, kill him. He's here. He's ripe for the picking. Now's the time. Kill him. And David said, I can't kill him. I can't kill the king. I can't kill the, the mighty. And so, no. David does cut part of his coat. And he keeps it. Saul goes at a distance, David comes out, and David hollers at him. David rem tells him, he says, look what I've got. Check, you, check your robe. And Saul tells David, and I'm paraphrasing, using my own terminology, modern terminology. Go back and read the story. But Saul tells him, he says, you're a better man than I am. David had mercy on Saul. David showed undeserved compassion towards a man that was hunting him religious, or religiously, zealously, like, if you will, like you would hunt a dog. Saul didn't deserve that mercy. Saul, Saul in many ways, deserved for David to, to take his life, if you look at it in one way. But David would not. And when David had an opportunity to kill him, David would not. The reason being because David was willing to show mercy. The Good Samaritan is a story we've already gone over, but it's a great example of mercy that's shown. Now, mercy not from the standpoint of forgiveness, but mercy from the standpoint of helping somebody that has a need. You see, we see people all the time. And yes, we have to ask ourselves sometimes, are they for real? I, I don't think you help people that are faking it. I don't think you, you help those that, that don't try to help themselves. I think we're supposed, to, we're supposed to do, you know, after all, we're supposed to work. We're supposed to do the best we can. Now, sometimes we, we fail in that. 
sometimes things don't always work out like we want them to or could or should. And, and those folks, though, we should help. But that's mercy. Undeserved compassion, helping those that have a need. The early church is a great example. We see it in Acts chapter 2. They helped others. They helped in the suffering of others. In Acts chapter 6, remember the, the Grecian widows, and remember there was a want there, there was a need there for those in, those ladies to be taken care of, and there was a, an asking for them to be taken care of. And what I believe is the appointment of the first deacons in the church were made there so that others could preach. There were others then that were to take care of these ladies. Undeserved compassion. These ladies hadn't deserved it or didn't deserve it, hadn't earned it, didn't do anything other than they were widows in need. And the church saw that that was a need that needed to be taken care of. And so they, in their mercy, helped those individuals. Well, you could go on, you could look at at 2 Corinthians chapter 9, where Paul talks about giving. And, and when you think about giving, why was giving important in the early church? Well, it was based to, basically started to help the poor saints in Jerusalem, right? To help those that are in need, to show mercy towards those in need. And so the early church is a great example. Jesus is a great example. We've already looked at the story one story with regards to Jesus, but think about Jesus having mercy. Jesus, remember when he fed the 5,000, they'd been with him all day. He had mercy on them. He felt compassion towards them. Jesus, when he came across the wood of Nain, remember how that, that her son had died and, and she evidently had no one left in her family. And we know that probably, how did Jesus deduce that? Probably from the procession because the family went first. Then, if you will, the casket, then the professional mourners, and then those that were interested, family and friends and all. But the family, she evidently was leading the way, and there was no one with her. And Jesus, said, it said, had compassion on her. Well, Jesus often was moved with compassion. The blind Remember those blind men in Matthew 20. As Jesus passed by, what did they say? Have mercy on us. Undeserved compassion. And so Jesus is a great example and what he did to help individuals that really were in need. Now, they're, they're, the mercy that he showed oftentimes that Jesus showed was not towards individuals that had done something to him. Now, he did say on while hanging on the cross, what? Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. It's mercy to look down upon those that are killing you and to say, God, forgive them. That's mercy, undeserved compassion. Well, as we've noticed with all of these Beatitudes, there's a promise. There's a promise. Notice what Jesus says. Go back to see what he says. And what does he say? He said, blessed are the merciful, for they shall find or they shall obtain or they shall have mercy, depending on the version that you, that you use. Okay, here's the principle. Here's the promise. You be merciful, guess guess what? You're going to receive mercy. You reap what you what? So. So if we sow mercy, we reap mercy. What if we sow an unmerciful life? We're not, we don't help those individuals that need help. We don't extend love and compassion towards those that have a need. We are individuals that truly look at folks and say, you got to deserve it. You got to deserve everything. Or we're not going to do anything for you. Jesus says, You won't gain mercy. Is God really that way? The psalmist said so. Psalm 18, verse 26, in praising God and talking about the greatness of God, he says that you will show mercy to the to the merciful. In other words, 
The psalmist says, God, I know that you're going to be merciful, undeserved compassion, towards who? The merciful. And so the psalmist is simply telling us God takes care of, God gives back to the individual that's merciful. God gives mercy. Jesus, as well, promised the same in Matthew chapter 6 in the same Sermon on the Mount. In verse 14 and 15, Jesus had just finished, if you will, what is the model prayer. We studied it, what, well, last Sunday morning for the sermon. Jesus said, if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive you. In other words, if you're not merciful, if you don't forgive others, forgive the wrong that they have committed against you, you won't receive the mercy of God. Strong thought, needless to say, but needless to say, it's the promise. And so Jesus gives in the Sermon on the Mount, here's the type of person I want. I not only want that individual that's humble, I not only want that individual that's contrite, I not only want that individual that is willing to, to be studious, but I also want that individual that is willing to be merciful. And my promise is, you'll obtain mercy. What a great promise that is. Because you see, we all want that mercy from God. Because we know, as we talked for just a little bit this morning, we don't always add up like we should. And we need that mercy. And so, Jesus reminds us in Luke chapter 6, in verse 36, Therefore be merciful, just as your Father also is merciful. Be merciful, just like your father's merciful. If we're if we are striving to be not only as God would have us, but to be as God as we are supposed to, then we need to be merciful, just like He's merciful. And in doing so, the promise is we will be blessed. Mercy. Just into this evening, as we contemplate. The very Sermon on the Mount and the very idea, we're reminded then of the importance of the mercy that God extends to us all. Mercy that is mentioned. Now, God is merciful. Remember in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3, he's the father of all mercies. But Paul reminds us in Titus chapter 3 and verse 5, it's not by works of righteousness which we've done, but according to his mercy. He saved us. And so we are recipients of God's mercy. May we ever be merciful. This, if you need to take advantage of that mercy, our prayer and plea is that you'll come. All together we stand and sing.